When you look at the sorts of you know, students who are going into building hardware and getting interested in manufacturing, are they people who had some interest in, in hardware and tactile stuff to begin with, or are they recent uh, converts to it from software? Or so, uh, yeah, so I think they come from all places. I mean, they, I think what happens, well, what happens when you get to the Media Lab is you get sort of immersed in uh, an environment where people play with hardware like people play with software. And so some of the, these people are just people who are, have a software idea and realize that they can control the experience better if they reach into hardware. Mm -hmm. Some of these are hardware people who are going into software and other people are, you know, musicians and experienced designers and, um, mm -hmm. and you know, people who are interested in learning. And, and the fact that you can play with hardware is just a new thing that's been added to your you know portfolio of tools and so so and, and I think that that's I think that's the right way to approach it and I think that that um, having both hardware and software design kind of in the same place um, is is what is generating this new category of, of hardware I mean look at the, the nest or what any of these great tools well Apple right I mean sure, sure. so so and I think what's been hard is in the past in academic disciplines, they kind of were separated. You had mechanical engineering and you had computer science. And I think that, that um, putting them together is really important. And, 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 and the Media Lab is, is a very much a tinkering and learning through doing sort of place. So yeah. you see a lot of rapid iteration and a lot of peer learning where the, where the kids are teaching each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it will be interesting to see, I mean, I can see Silicon Valley picking it up quickly. Um, and you know, there are, Stanford and other places have places where some of this happens, but, um, but I do think it isn't in the DNA of Silicon Valley yet at the level that it could be. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm interested to see how we can con contribute to that because I think it, it, it is a little bit more in, in, in the DNA here. Right, right, right. Um, it presents these cool opportunities for, uh, for design where you can design beyond the screen, right? Mm -hmm. And not be constrained by having a keyboard and a screen mediate um, people's interaction with your software at heart, mm -hmm. right? Like something like the Misfit Shine, which is this wearable um, that has no screen uh, and no buttons, and you interact with it by tapping on it, and then little tiny LEDs uh, mm -hmm. come up around the edges, um, is a really cool example of that. If you have control all the way down to the software, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, all the way down to the hardware level, um, then you can, you can design this full integration of hardware and software yeah. that just foregoes that kind of um, the full integration of hardware and software that can do something really novel with, mm -hmm. um, with design and interaction. Yeah. And there's also this, this side of it too where uh, design beyond the screen means you're using more machine learning and just foregoing interaction altogether, mm -hmm. right? Something like um, Google Now where uh, it gives you an alert that tells you how long it'll take to get to your next appointment without you interacting with the phone at all, mm -hmm. right? Or um, you could imagine that an autonomous car would work this way as well. You say, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd, uh, I'd like Indian food tonight. And then it goes through a handful of the um, interactions that you would have to go through yourself, looking up an Indian restaurant you'd like based on your preferences, finding a recommendation, finding directions to it, putting the address into your GPS, and then mm -hmm. driving there. Each of those is, a, is an interaction interface that's being replaced by a machine in some respect, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in that sense, the idea that user interface is something that you're paying attention to, the screen, um, I think is pretty narrow because you know, our, we're so capable of, like driving a car is, is a very complex parallel processing task and somehow we're able to do that. But when we think about human computer interfaces, we've typically focused on your finger and your eye, right. but that's a very narrow band. And so there's one part which is a lot of this autonomous um, things happening around you, but you also have um, your whole body. You have sensors. The computer could, should know when your blood sugar is low, and and it, it, it and it and it and your your body can be communicating. And there's also sort of peripheral vision. There's sort of pattern recognition. So I think I think what's going to be kind of interesting is to see how the future of interface, you know, because because I think for instance th there's a lot of complexity that you can't 
verbalize or, or you can't um, sc scrawl with a little pen, mm -hmm. but that your body can somehow express. And, and so, so, so I think that that, and, and, and we call it bionics, so we, we like that sort of slightly retro word, but, but interfacing with the computer, with your brain directly or with your body, connecting to your nervous system, sort of embedded chips, um, um, that, that, that's going to create a much more sort of systems oriented interface right, with, with right, us. Right. And, and, and I think that that's, um, you know, I, that's coming really soon.